Thank you for having me, Noam, and uh, especially in this great, cute company <laughs> with Agnieszka and Schumann. So I'll share with you some glimpses of my artistic exploration into biological and computational systems. A lot of my work simultaneously zooms out to space and into the gut, looking for connections between these two realms. Um, much of it uses some kinds of scientific uh, imaging and sonification methods from microscopes to telescopes to artificial neur neural networks um, and always to science fictional ends. Uh, I'll focus on the digital projects in particular, considering today's topic. However, I should start with the slime mold. Uh, this is an image of me ingesting uh, Fissarum polycephalum, the single celled yet many headed species of slime mold uh, in a performance titled Many Headed Reading in 2016. Um, slime mold is really the organism that first led me on the path of biological experimentation after a training in media, art, and sound, mostly. Uh, the slime mold is often referred to as a biocomputer. When ingesting it, I imagine that its hive-like behavior is programming my own. Uh, a performance guided by the slime mold uh, from within can be considered as a form of artificial intelligence. The slime helps me make connections where none previously existed. Its movement makes me takes me where I need to go. Uh, the slime mold coordinates itself entirely through the sensory feedback with its environment. It, its cognition is identical to movement. It knows exactly and only what it does. This behavior likens to the theory of extended mind, a philosophical concept put forth in the late 1990s that the brain and its environment can be seen as an indistinguishable coupled system. I'll continue with a project from 2017, premised on the idea that ever since the Renaissance, the most complex machines that we've developed have been used as the analogy of the mind. But the human mind is intuitive and too complex an organism to formalize. For example, the head brain works together with the gut brain. Computers are by design deterministic. They follow set procedures. In my work, Gut Machine Poetry, in collaboration with Johanna Lundberg and Vincent de Belval, the idea is to introduce chaos into computing by uh, inserting fermenting, fermenting foodstuff into the guts of a computer. So we put together a homebrew computer operated by a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast in a kombucha tea ferment and producing a new kind of language. What you're looking at here is the still image of a, mic a digital microbial poetry culture, a so-called wetware random number generator based on microscopic footage of a SCOBY connected to a series of letters. The stochastic movement of yeast eating sugar affects the jumbling of letters on the screen. The letters are based on a text about code laws and the gut brain axis. My interpretation of an ancient Sumerian incantation featured in the sci-fi classic Snow Crash and dealing with universal language. The word jumbling algorithm connected to the kombucha feed takes after Jumbo, a program that cognitive scientist and AI researcher Douglas Hofstetter developed to solve anagrams based on the actions inside a biological cell. In his experiment, Letters are combined and broken apart by different types of enzymes that, as he describes, jiggle around, glomming onto structures where they find them, kicking reactions into gear. Uh, in addition to my obsession for um, kombucha, I also love natto, a sticky Japanese food made from fermented soybeans. Its main ingredient, Bacillus subtilis, is an extremophilic bacterium that has also been used as a survival indicator in spaceflight experimentation. Tolerating physically and geochemically extreme conditions, its spores could have been blown to Earth from another planet by the cosmic radiation pressure. Uh, perhaps life itself arrived here in this spore-bearing form. Maybe it was sent by some higher form of intelligence. Anyway, the, the so-called alien is in, in us. Um, and here you can see the 
Bacillus subtilis, natto bacteria from a machine's perspective uh, or through a machine eye. Uh, in fact, this is the only way in which we as humans can ever look at bacteria via the complex tools of observation and representation that we've devised. Uh, and from this viewpoint, microbes can be considered as completely technological. This image is a still from my 2018 video, Nimia Seti. I placed the space and got bacteria under a microscope and together with an intelligent machine and a few ingenious humans, namely Memo Akten and Damien Anri, we devised a written and a spoken language based on the bacteria's movements, as well as early ideas of a Martian tongue in an attempt to give it a voice. So the video shows an AI watching footage of the Bacillus subtilis bacteria under a microscope and generating a script or calligraphy based on an analysis of what it sees. The work has its roots in the seances of the Swiss-French spirit medium, Helen Smith, who in the late um, 19th century claimed she could communicate with Martians. Her Martian language is actually considered as one of the first documented forms of glossolalia or speaking in tongues or vocalizing speech like syllables that lack any readily comprehensible meaning. And in Smith's time, astronomers equipped with early low resolution telescopes believed that they had discovered canals on the red planet, thereby bringing to public attention the idea that Mars might be habitable. By the early 20th century, improved astronomical observations re revealed that the canals had, had been nothing more than scratches on the telescope's lens. Um, contemporary high resolution mapping of the surface of Mars shows no such features. Today, extremophilic bacteria may be considered as the most likely Martians. And most interestingly, they also are known to live in our guts, uh, contributing not only to our health and well-being, but our thoughts and emotions too essentially making us who we are or speaking through us. Uh, in Nimia Seti, they are speaking through the intelligent machine portrayed as a uh, kind of a spirit medium. Um, this is a sort of a crystal that presents everything seen by the machine medium and or, or oracle uh, in the movements of the bacteria over a period of 12 minutes, which is how long the video is. And I guess a lot of my work looks at or looks for the ghosts in the intelligent machines of our creation that are increasingly shaping our reality. On the, on the one hand, the work is about getting in touch with the non-human conditions of the computers around us. And on the other hand, it's about the computers getting in touch with the more than human world around them. Another focus are the invisible organic life forms that govern our lives. So embodied cognition in both the human and the machine um, expanded consciousness at large. Um, iMagma from 2019 consists of two parts, um, physical installation of lava heads with blobs of liquid and color in motion, provides a seed for the machine learning based generation of images and text in a mobile application. The hand-blown glass lava heads, two of them pictured here at the um, Oslo Kunstverening, are also my neuroplastic portraits. One of the starting points of this project is the lava lamp as the original psychedelic technology designed for those about to trip, as Dimas Villieri put it. Another one are the deep dreaming artificial neural networks that present the more contemporary image of access to the thing in itself. The installation with cameras next to the heads draws from experiments by the engineers at Sun Microsystems in the 90s, who suggested that lava lamps were a useful tool, tool for generating randomness. Even today, a wall of lava lamps, the wall of entropy, encrypts online data at a web performance company in, in San Francisco. Instead of randomness, however, my work looks for pattern science or meaning in the lava movements. And the eMagma app is inspired by the origins of binary code in the I Ching or Book of Changes um, with input not only from the lava heads, but also from mobile phones uh, worldwide. It performs divinations based on the digital blobs that form. The divinations read like 
trip reports of sorts. Um, in fact, Erowitz uh, Shaojing archives, along with the Internet Sacred Text Archive, is what the AI-powered system has learned from. This picture is actually from Altered States, an anthology published by Ignota that features some of my favorite divinations from the Imagma Oracle. Mm, this work is called Neurofuzzy, and it's from this year. Most recently, my work has been extremely corporeal in nature or by nature, um, and that's partly because of the residency that Noah mentioned that I did at MIT, where I got really into the topic of bacterial therapies and in particular their proposed mental effects. The idea that we can accommodate the bacteria of others through remedies like fecal transplants and feel better mentally. Um, on the campus, there were these stool-based biobanks, a bit like seed banks for plants, that focus on collecting and preserving the biodiversity of human gut microbes for future generations, basically viewing human evolution and existence through our symbiotic uh, microbial cultures. There's this idea of a holobiont after Lynn Margulis that's central to my thinking, considering ourselves as entities made of many species that live in, on, and around us, all inseparably linked in their ecology and evolution. Um, the state or quality of being a causal context for something else feels right to me, and it makes categories such as individual slash community or organism slash environment or inside slash outside all, all fuzzy. Uh, the thermographic body shot pictured here uh, focuses on milk running through me and forming a river in the hypersea after geologist Diana and Mark McMenamin that connects not only humans but also the microorganisms and, and nutrients that inhabit it and travel through it. The work also links back to the bacterial therapies and namely psychobiotics because uh, human milk, both organic and synthetic lab cultured milk, uh, seems to shape the development of babies' nervous systems through feeding their gut bacteria. I know this is already a lot of stuff in a short time frame to, to digest, and pun intended there, but since we're on the topic of digital art today, and Noam, you wanted to talk about NFTs, I thought I should also mention Yamsu Shibiko, my first and, and only NFT so far. Um, it's a video Vanitas or Memento Mori. Uh, the work takes after historical artworks that remind us of the transience of life and the vanity of earthly pursuits. Uh, a Vanitas often symbolizes something opposed to material, material wealth. And I had an idea to create a crypto Vanitas that would feature the emblematic foods of decentralized finance, yam, sushi, and pickle, after these popular DeFi protocols of the same names, rotting away in a little terrarium at my studio for quite a long time. Uh, the process is accompanied by this very guttural song. Yam, sushi, pickle is really a meditative piece. Making it for me was a way to spend some time thinking about this emerging ecosystem that is itself very much alive. And that's probably what we'll be talking more about today. Um, I'll hand over to Agnieszka now and um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jana. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, Noam, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be here, especially with my friends and collaborators. I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I'm going to start just uh, by referencing a sort of point of departure for my work, which um, is the notion of collective intelligence. And uh, I have been interested, uh, actually, uh, like Yena, in slime molds. And slime mold was also, in a way, a point of departure. I actually often start my my talks with an image of the slime mold. And um, and and uh, so the um, beginnings of my work actually uh, start from um, the interest in, in the phenomena of uh, based on um, distributed cognition, extended mind, and plural subjectivity, and especially plural subjectivity in uh, various systems, uh, biological or um, technological. Um, uh, is very important for my work. And so uh, um, uh, I was um, interested in how 
essentially the ideology of individualism brought us to a state of society collapse and, and climate change. And we have to rethink everything, uh, our, um, you know, the history of humanity from the point of view of plural subjectivity. So I started looking at um, this phenomenon of collective intelligence in, in nature and in, in, in culture and in um, society. And, uh, and I did um, several projects with termites. So I basically started outsourcing my work to various systems of um, collective intelligence. And what is collective intelligence? Briefly, it is um, essentially a phenomenon that appears in complex systems uh, of various kinds. Uh, the systems can be a bacterial colony, a colony of termites, but also um, uh, the stock exchange or society or the human brain. And the collective intelligence consists in the emergence of novel and unpredictable um, forms um, that um, emerge from um, thousands or millions of elements, molecules, bacteria, termites, humans, and so on. Um, so the, the first projects that I did that I think it's relevant to just briefly uh, show here were outsourced to termite colonies. So I realized that termites are almost blind and a co colony of termites can build a sculpture and the termites will not notice um, the ways in which uh, they are in a way being exploited. So they, 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 they can be given um, colorful pigments, um, and uh, crystals and gold, and then they built as if they were building out of soil and mud. So these are the first sculptures that I outsourced to termite colonies, first in the um, desert in Namibia, and then in, in a lab in Florida. And um, each of these sculptures is um, created by a colony of termites. And uh, there's about a million or a couple million termites producing each work. And I, uh, I've been continuing by developing various projects. So I've basically set up a, a factory of, of uh, termite producing uh, um, termite sculptures. And uh, each of them are, is built by a colony of, of living organisms over three or four months of time. And you can actually set, tell something about a given colony, uh, about the collective personality, looking at the shapes of these mounds. And these are the negative casts of the insides of these termites. So basically this kind of neural network shapes are the corridors that termites build inside. And I just pour liquid zinc inside them. And these are created in Namibia. Um, so uh, this brought me to exploring uh, also collective intelligence through technology and in society. And uh, basically, the main subject of my uh, research is the direction in which we're currently evolving as a species and the role of technology and in, in, in various processes the transformations of the human and especially thinking about the future of labor and creativity and um, the exploitations that are present in surveillance capitalism. So the ways in which we be became um, uh, a giant factory as societies, we are just treated as giant factories of data production and exploitation. Um, and we are all becoming this sort of ghost workers in a system of, of, of digital um, surveillance capitalism. So um uh, uh, this series of works um, is entitled um, The End of Signature, and I worked with um, scientists, with computer scientists, to create an algorithm to fuse together thousands of signatures into one a collective signature. So uh, in this case, I'm, I collected signatures of the visitors of the Guggenheim Museum thousands of visitors and to create this collective signature to rethink how in today's world uh, visitors of museums of uh, um, galleries uh, by photographing and instagramming images of artworks they are also contributing to the creation of value of these artworks uh, this is a, a collective signature also done with artificial intelligence, fusing signatures, in this case of all the uh, employees and board, board members um, of the Cleveland Museum of Art. So in this case, it's kind of an amalgamation of the social capital or culture capital, um, everybody that contributes to, to what this institution is. And again, um, fused together with artificial intelligence. And this is the most recent project in this series at um, MIT for a uh, commission for the um, MIT List um, Art Center and Kendall Square. So two um, 
uh, on two buildings, on two new new buildings on Kendall Square, I developed collective signatures for the uh, for um, all the scientists and academics that have ever worked at MIT. Uh, and I'm interested in, again, this um, idea how uh, in, in human societies, uh, slowly we evolved this idea of individualism that has been shaping our economies and our creative processes, but that this paradigm has, has got to be um, abandoned. And uh, the reason for it is that we, ha we have never been singular. We've always been pl plural and uh, the way that produ we produce culture, that we produce uh, tools or ideas or art has always been from the from the beginning from early monuments of culture such as the bible or the mythologies through any kind of tools uh, even the most primitive tools these were product products of collective intelligence of of um of entire society. So in this case, I'm treating the um, uh, uh, development in science and in academic research um, as a product of, of a collective intelligence. So signatures of all the academics and scientists from MIT, uh, they are actually stored from the beginning of this um, um, institution. So uh, we could use also signatures for, of people who are no longer alive. And we created one sign collective signature for this community of, of um, uh, scientists and academics. And the second signature um, uh, is of uh, the community of people living in this area in Cambridge that is also evolving and changing and becoming more diverse. Um, and this, these works are uh, in motion. So uh, as you can see, it's um, uh, perpetually signing and resigning. And so the form kind of changes and kind of erases itself and it becomes like a palimpsest. It was similar on the facade of the Guggenheim Museum and in many other iterations. And also I'm using obviously a technology that will very soon become a, a fossil of technology namely uh, handwriting. And I'm interested in creating forms that are touching precisely on that, how uh, different forms of technology are um, uh, becoming living fossils. And as we all are aware, we're using um, handwriting less and less, and very soon our uh, signatures will be replaced by uh, different kinds of digital identification, maybe our, our um, fingerprinting, maybe iris scans, or maybe even our um, DNA samples will be used as form of I, uh, our individual identification. So um, the, the ways that in which this works are kind of conceived is to, uh, as, as a, something uh, that could become a future fossil of technology just in a couple of years. So the change of these works, the status of the, these works will change very soon. Um, at the Guggenheim, we also used an automaton machine, um, Autopen, so the visitors could um, leave their signatures, as you can see here. And then um, this machine that was actually developed for Thomas Jefferson originally to replicate um, signatures uh, uh, of one person, but in such a way that each one looks like a handwritten and not machinic. So this was, for example, this is now used by presidents of the United States to send letters to, say, war veterans, where each signature looks individual, even though it's done via machine, because it's carrying the, the, the pen used by a given individual. So in this case, uh, I used this machine to create a signature of collectivity. And the Guggenheim Museum used this the these blank sheets of paper for their uh, correspondence with other institutions for about a year. And they were all signed with this collective signature of all the visitors fused into one form. Uh, this is my recent collaboration uh, with the um, MIT CSAIL uh, Artificial Intelligence Lab, and this reconnects again to my interest in uh, biology, synthetic biology, and um, I'm thinking also about um, uh, collective intelligence in relationship to um, how uh, uh, um, um, we as humans, but every living organisms are actually polyphonies of various agencies from microbial to, in the case of humans now, also AI, algorithmic. And um, in this case, um, I thought about also predictions of the future that are done with artificial intelligence, because right now uh, these predictions are uh, very often determining the way that we think about the future and determine our behavior, um, a subject that I'm also exploring with the NFT. I will talk about it uh, at the end. But in this case, I was um, uh, we created a prediction of how the species of um, uh, a bonsai tree, juniper bonsai tree, which is a very popular bonsai, is going to evolve um, in uh, in the future. And so uh, 
basically we used um, AI algorithms because what these uh, algorithms do is they essentially optimize um, a form and uh, a similar process happens in biological evolution what else is evolution if not an um, um, deep time very long process of optimization of a form in response to var various environmental factors the, the situation in, in a biological situation and the ecosystems in the world so um, so I uh, we used AI and we fused thousands of uh, photographs hundreds of thousands of photographs of this particular species of the um, juniper and bonsai tree to create a form uh, that uh, basically predicts how the species will evolve in the future. And then this form was printed in uh, 3D printed in resin and, and painted, painted in this one single color and entangled with a real 75 year old bonsai tree. And they are basically now creating one form. And so affect uh, this, this um, prediction of the future of the species is effectively kind of affecting the way that this living tree is going to grow in the future. And because it's kind of limited how it can grow around it. Mm, and, you know, I was uh, the title of the piece is semiotic life because I'm also interested, of course, in the uh, semiotic life of forms of uh, in today's world. Uh, a kind of um, example of a collective intelligence form is an internet meme that grows and has no uh, multiple authors, thousands of authors, no single one author. Um, and um, bonsai trees were not only the first example of um how humans were well, one of the first examples when humans shaped nature in, in the human intervention and in physical uh species by you know shaping this this how this tree trunks and tree forms were evolving but there is also a history of the bonsai as a, a kind of a sign a form uh, with changing fads and fashions around around this um uh, bonsai that became became ornaments themselves so i was interested in of course the semiotic evolution of a sign versus uh, uh, and how this can be predicted also with AI or not. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention yet is that the reason why what, the, what brought me to collective intelligence is the fact that today we're living in a world that that like neoliberal capitalism is making us think that anything can be computed with um, artificial intelligence, anything can be predicted, which obviously is completely false because a lot of this collective in intelligence phenomena, such as how people make decisions individually and in society, they just cannot be predicted because humans are irrational beings that make decisions yeah in a very illogical irrational fashion and that's for example one of the reasons why it's impossible to predict um election results even with artificial intelligence uh so um and i was also yes exploring this ways um in which um uh, this um, idea of predicting the future is actually um very um it's very much changing the way that uh, um, we are, uh, this future is going to unfold because thinking about the future kind of changes this actual future. And this is a series of paintings entitled Conversions that I've been developing for the past few years, uh, which I also created with the use of artificial intelligence. And um, so um, these are paintings executed on copper plate. Uh, this is the same painting a few minutes later and a few minutes later and a few minutes later. Um, so um, these are paintings that are alive. They are evolving like living organisms or, or ecosystems. And uh, they are executed with liquid um, uh, crystal pigments uh, that are um, painted on copper plate. And um, each painting is connected to an animation that is created through the use of artificial intelligence through mining of um, uh, hundreds of thousands of Twitter posts of the members of um, protest movements around the globe. Um, we are using sentiment analysis algorithms to uh, look at the sentiment uh, feelings expressed in Twitter posts, uh, whether it's anger um, uh, or uh, joy or anxiety or curiosity or sadness. Um, and um, th these um, feelings are mined with artificial intelligence and then aggregated and each painting is basically powered by the kind of animation that creates a sort of choreography of a certain uh, period of time of a couple of months when these feelings were captured um, uh, through mining twitter posts and um, 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 instagram posts and reddit posts of the members of protest movements. So the idea is that the painting is kind of behind each painting, there is like a society, or there are like thousands of ghost workers, one could say of people expressing their emotions online. And um, the painting lives with this changes of 
emotions. Um, this is um, a project um, entitled Digital, uh, excuse me, uh, entitled um, Chemical Garden that links um, uh, yeah, digital capitalism uh, with geology, because what you see here are um, forms that I'm growing. They are crystal forms that I'm growing um, inside the solution of water glass, which is essentially sodium silicate. And um, these forms that um, emerge are um, uh, created by mixing salts of various metals that are used in computer and server farms and on our mobile phones and various technological digital devices. And these metals such as um, uh, copper or iron or um, uh, manganese or cobalt these salts were actually present already at the beginning, just before life emerged at the bottom of the oceans. And uh, when they mixed in certain conditions near the um, thermal vents, they started producing forms that look like uh, life. They look like plants. And uh, I recreated the conditions to, to, to build these forms, to have these forms emerge. And so this is um, what grows inside of these aquariums. And they look very much plant-like, but they are all in our, um, this is a mixed of inorganic chemicals of essentially what is inside of our computers. Um, and um, the paradoxical um, uh, phenomenon is the fact that today, obviously, mining of all these metals is very destructive for entire ecosystems. But at the same time, these precise metals, um, they were at the inception of life and they to some degree caused life. So some of the um, fossils of these um, um, ancient chemical gardens were considered to be fossils of life until recent experiments with, um, by uh, NASA scientists that proved um, that, it's, um, that it's actually inorganic chemicals. Um, and these are forms that are um, examples of my work with uh, geology, speculative geology, that kind of is a good introduction to the work Sentimenti that I'm going to show in a second. So this series of works entitled um, post Fordite uh is aggregating is is based on this quasi geological formation that was discovered by workers of now defunct bankrupt uh, factories in detroit and many other um towns around the globe where cars used to be produced and so um after the factories and for example detroit were closed the workers uh, started scavenging what was still left there on the factory floors and they discovered that over 100 years of the um, uh, car manufacturing, um, there were um, uh, particles of um, uh, spray paint that were floating in the air that were accumulating on the production lines. And in very high temperatures, they uh, congealed and they fossilized into these forms that look like ag agate stone or some other geological formation. And you can see the strata of various um, fashions and fats for different car colors that uh, accumulated over the years. So I started buying from fragments of Fordite from these former factory workers from different parts of the world. And this Fordite is currently circulated online by workers. There's actually a whole market of this material and it accrued uh, value because it can be polished and cut and used to produce geology. So um, uh, it was very interesting for me as this is also an aggregation and accumulation, of course, of this byproducts of human um, uh, labor and they are forms of uh, footprints actually and as was my work conversions that I showed earlier I'm interested in this relationship between human footprints digital footprints and and um, uh, human uh, carbon footprints and how today in contemporary world they are actually um, impossible to disentangle and so I started buying these fragments of fordite also because this is a, a material the resources of which are finite because the obviously now the manufacturing of cars was replaced by machines, it was automated, and so there is a finite certain amount of fordite in the world, just like there is a, for example, finite um, uh, exhaustive um, amount of Bitcoin, as you know, because there is a, there's a fixed amount of Bitcoin that was um, created that can be produced. Um, and so I started uh, um, collecting these fragments from the workers, and then I create these forms, and each facet comes from workers from a different factory. And the whole like sculptures are entitled post fordite imagining obviously the, the how the factory changed in contemporary world and how obviously the, many of the workers became to some degree artists or are entrepreneurs and how we're essentially living in 
this global factory of um, production and exploitation where we all became workers. And this brings me to Sentimentite, which is actually my collaboration with uh, Schumann and with the platform that he co-founded, Zine. And um, here you can see the animations of the um, NFTs um, uh, post, um, uh, sentimentite. Uh, sentimentite is an NFT, um, expanded NFT, which exists as these forms that you can see here um, that are evolving um, digital forms that are, again, um, discussing the, the relationships between digital capitalism and geology. And um, I'm particularly interested in how the, the past 20 years, since the beginning of like social media, especially the past 10 years, um, history is written in very different ways. We are, uh, history, history is to some degree crowdsourced because individual people around the globe are contributing to how the news is generated and how opinions about what's happening in the world is currently, is, is constantly kind of in this feedback loop with events. And so um, I uh, also am interested in, of course, the, the relationship between digital footprints and carbon footprints and uh, our impact on the global geology. So these forms were created in collaboration with computational social scientist, Justin Lane. Uh, again, we use sentiment analysis to, in this case, capture the opinion dynamics and discussions online around um, uh, 100 most seismic events of the uh, past 20 years, for example, the Fukushima um, nuclear disaster or the explosions in Beirut, but also Black Lives Matter or um, uh, Arab Spring, Brexit, and the meteoric rise of Bitcoin. Uh, and this... I'm sorry, I should I'm finish. Gonna have, yeah, I'm going to okay. have to stop you now. It's okay. fascinating. And okay. I, uh, I just want to mention to everyone that the NFT, uh, this artwork is available to watch on the Zine website, and, and there is a list of all the seismic cultural events that you um, that you implemented inside the work, inside this uh, expanded NFT. And this is the expanded it's... NFT, uh, the, the sculpture the created object. by mixture of more than 60 objects that circulated as informal currencies in the world, uh, and it can be redeemed as these sculptures. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. And now uh, let's uh, hear Shumon a little bit. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Zine and the current project that you're uh, working on. Of course. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, again, thank you, Noam, for this um, invitation. Uh, thank you to Agnieszka for introducing Noam and, and, uh, and me a few weeks ago. Um, greetings from Dubai, where it's uh, not snowing. It's uh, 26 degrees centigrade uh, or 79 degrees Fahrenheit, which I had to look up because I have no idea how to do the, the conversion. Um, so uh, I was asked by Noam to talk about Zine. Um, and, and in a way, this is, uh, was perfectly set up uh, by Agnieszka's um, uh, last uh, sort of the last part of her presentation. And as she mentioned, uh, Zine is a uh, startup that I co-founded earlier this year. Um, we uh, relaunched with Sentite um, and we're working with uh, Yana for an exciting project uh, next year. So what I do here now is sketch out some of Zine's backstory and some of our kind of mission mechanics, as it were. So a little bit of uh, history just to get things going. So Zine emerged as an idea from the London crypto scene connected to DAWO, D-A-O-W-O. -O -O. Uh, it was a blockchain laboratory and debate series for reinventing the arts that was spearheaded by Ben Vickers, uh, then at the Serpentine. Uh, gallery and Ruth Catlow uh, and also um, with Peter Holsgrove, who's one of the co-founders of Zine. So Z, uh, season 00 began in 2020. It predates my involvement. Um, it was very much inspired by Sol Lewitt's wall drawings. Um, some of you may know that, um, which were executed by assistants from the artist's instructions. So collectors of the uh, zero, zero season could fabricate artworks that they collected on Zine, 
Um, and there are different artists uh, like Ed Fornelis, Petra Courtright, uh, Omsko Social Club, um, even uh, Kenny Schachter as well uh, was involved. So interactivity between artist and collector was at the foreground of the initial experience. Uh, fast forward a little bit to 2021, while JPEG mania took hold of the whole NFT um, uh, craze, uh, Zine took stock and chose uh, what we call a pill of active silence. Instead, we, ra we raised money from friends and a supportive group of crypto OGs and venture capitalists. A small, highly dedicated team was drawn together. Here, a shout out to Peter, Sarah, Tom, Fazil, and Fabio, with an honorary mention to Gabriel Stones, who also worked with uh, Agnieszka on Sentimenti. Um, the next part I, I call art in the expanded field. So something that I've been saying uh, again and again and again, actually this year, is that um, uh, 64,000 years of art from cave paintings to Picasso have proven that when it comes to emotionally moving encounters, sometimes a screenshot is simply not enough. So, you know, can art NFTs, and here it's important to make a, 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 a sort of category distinction, one, one talks about NFTs uh, in a very, uh, generalistic way, but there are different, I mean, ultimately it's a, it's a, form, of tech, it's a form of technology. There are different kinds of, uh, of NFTs. There are collectibles, um, there are PFP projects, um, and there are art NFTs, and there are very, very, very many more. But we asked, can art NFTs be more than digital artifacts only? So this is the, this is the question that's at the heart of uh, what we do at Zine. And also earlier this year, as we were beginning to uh, kind of uh, narrativize, um, and my job uh, title actually is Chief Narrative Zine, um, I remembered a very influential essay by Rosalind Krauss uh, from 1979, um, where she introduced the idea of sculpture in the expanded field. And she said that in the late 1960s and the uh, 70s, sculpture burst out of the white cube gallery and expanded into new situations that seemed strange and unfamiliar. So, you know, a question here is what if NFTs could do something similar? So here we fast forward to 2018 to something called the EIP721 protocol, which is the Ethereum Improvement Protocol 721. Um, and it says, uh, so this outlines the, um, the the technological um, kind of uh, structure, uh, programming uh, facility of, uh, of how NFTs will work on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, in this uh, document, it says, NFTs can represent ownership over digital or physical assets. We consider that a, a diverse universe of assets, and we know you will dream up many more. Um, so the interesting thing here is that uh, emphasis over the last few years has been given to the idea of digital assets, but the EIP protocol specifically also refers to physical assets as well. So we believe that NFTs are yet to fulfill the promise of what this uh, EIP 721 protocol truly set out to achieve. And so was born Zine's expanded NFTs. These are artworks collected as, as NFTs, which are then redeemed on chain the unique material counterparts. So just to zoom out uh, again a little bit, somewhere in the mid 2010s, when it comes to our screen devices, our relations uh, drastically and dramatically reversed. We are now extensions of our devices. We are now its prosthesis. It often feels like our devices know what we want before we do. It remembers what we forget. And it's often the first thing that people see in the morning and often the last thing before they go to sleep. This is a new power relationship, which I call the great reversal. History is littered with these switches, moments where the magnetic poles of meaning reverse. In the 15th century, Gutenberg ushered in the age of the printing press. Of course, the Chinese invented it several centuries before that. But this began a process of decentralizing knowledge, which led to profound political consequences 
as well as the rewiring of mankind's collective brain to speak to uh, Agnieszka's interest in collective consciousness. A century later, uh, Copernicus shifted the center of the universe from Earth to the sun, which was considered an act of blasphemy by the church. So every paradigm shift causes shock, confusion, excitement, doubt, and importantly, a redistribution of power. It's clear to almost everyone now that ever since the birth of the internet, we have been undergoing a seismic transformation in our relationship to information, value, and of course, to each other. Crypto, Web3, and NFTs expand and extend the internet's potential. As far as I'm concerned, they're all part of the great reversal. The two and a half dimension. Since, COVID, since the COVID-19 pandemic arrived, we learned quickly that we spend most of our lives or much of our lives now in what I call the two and a half dimension. Where exactly is the two and a half dimension? It's between the second dimension of the screen that you're looking at and the third dimension of the device that the screen is part of, your fingers and the space that you're sitting or standing in. NFTs are not only native to crypto and Web3, they seem to have become native to a great reversal world where so much of what we share, buy and discover the digital means. For example, it increasingly feels as if films and TV shows are merely the pretext for magnetic sharing. Screenshots are an expression of love for something that you've encountered. Babies swipe across real objects because surely everything is swipeable. We all know what the two and a half dimension feels like, but we don't know if it really even exists. The two and a half dimension is the non-hierarchy between online and offline, between on-chain and off-chain. It's the seamless switching between messaging the same person simultaneously on different apps, which is something I do uh, every day. It's spending an av average of 2.7 seconds looking at, at an artwork in a museum, while news about an earthquake or the divorce of your favorite celebrity couple takes up the next 2.7 seconds of your attention. Expanded NFTs. So expanded NFTs are non-fungible tokens that can be redeemed on chain for unique physical counterparts, implemented as an extension of the Zora open source NFT smart contract. Conceptually, we aim to enable the creation of digital first artworks that are not limited in how they can be expressed physically. Today, this works using an on-chain process to govern the production of physical assets by an appointed person or team. In our case, that's Sarah Bayless, who's our chief producer at Zine. And she works closely with artists like Agnieszka in Jena to produce detailed specifications and enacted when a collective figures which expanded NFT. Over time, we imagine a decentralized ecosystem of production, removing the reliance of a centralized team. We call this progressively decentralized production. So expanded NFTs have four primary states, minted, sealed, unsealed, and delivered. Since Zine is a interface to contemporary art and crypto using the Telegram uh, channel, collectors of expanded NFTs trigger redemption through the Zine uh, telegram channel. Upon delivery of the artwork, owners undertake the final step in the process with an on-chain transaction confirming delivery and unlocking the, NX, the expanded NFT. This marks the completion of the expanded NFT state change process. Uh, lastly, I want to just mention um, the uh, artists that we're working with and the kinds of artists that we're working with. So at Zine, we think there's a uh, huge untapped potential to foreground the social, philosophical, and material setting of the two and a half dimension. And expanded NFTs are our web 2.5 native proposition. So that's also, I think, uh, an important term, you know, we'll be familiar with, with web two. Um, now with, let's talk about web uh, three, but in reality, we're mostly inhabiting uh, web 2.5. Right. So, you know, even when we're talking about decentralized autonomous organizations and networks, you know, they're often taking place on uh, centralized um, messaging platforms or social media platforms. Right. So this is where it's a two and a half dimension during Web 2.5. 
Uh, and in a way, this is the kind of meta context that we're thinking about expanded NFTs. So historically, artists have always pushed new media, whether it be tempera paint, photography, 16 millimeter film, VHS video, or indeed the internet, except the two and a half dimension is more than a medium. It's a newly expanded site that invites new work that none of us has yet imagined. This is what we call art in the expanded field. And Zine believes that there are contemporary artists today whose investigative and intrepid spirits position them perfectly to experiment and explore this proposition. As we saw, Agnieszka was our collaborator on expanded NFTs. We think of Sentimentite as a kind of manifesto uh, for us at Zine, and we're so thrilled at the outcome. And there's some very announcements about Sentimentite's fate, which we'll be uh, able to make earlier. The next drop in 2022 is with the London-based uh, artist Shezad Dawood and his studio. And his project is called Sea of Redemption. And it's a new kind of PFP project. Uh, PFP, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, profile picture project. Uh, most of you will know of uh, CryptoPunks and uh, Bored Apes, etc. Um, but Sea of Redemption is a new kind of PFP project that plays with this very moribund down mood at the moment in the crypto and NFT bear market, where prices have dropped by at least 90% from uh, last year. So Sea of Redemption assembles an aquatic cast list of characters and a, what we call a redemption wallet where collectors can deposit their diminished or now worthless NFTs in the hope that merms will take pity on them and offer them redemption. Lastly, we're working uh, also at the same time with artists such as uh, Jakob uh, Kutsteinstein, Maxim Zestov, Yuri Patterson, and of course, uh, Yena Sutella, um, all of whom are generating extremely original narratives and mechanisms for the two and a half dimension. Um, it's a talk here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Shuman. Thank you. It's so interesting to hear about this exciting project. It's 1 p.m. here, and you saw, you, you felt that there was 60 minutes um, crossing. So I do want to insist on asking you one question. Uh, and of course, you know, Shimon, you mentioned in our talk that NFT is a post-content post art. And I wonder what it means in so many ways uh, in terms of uh, actions. You described it as what happens after the minting process, what ha happens after we launch an NFT. It's about the actions that happen after. And of course, it sends branches to uh, post-minimalism and to conceptual art, uh, but also to um, post-war European art of what lies beneath the surface, etc. But with that, uh, I wonder what are the possible actions for this kind of artwork to thrive and, and that's a question for all of you, of course, from an artistic standpoint, from a curatorial standpoint, um, except from, of course, the financial transactions. Like how can we, or alternatively, we're articulating a new way of, um, let's say, Warholian uh, money uh, kind of art movement, but I'm sure there is much more than that to the different technological applications that uh, the artists will deploy. So how can we conceive of those actions? What kind of a verb list we can uh, come up with to describe those? Please feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, I mean, I would love to hear what Agnieszka thinks about this, having worked on Sentimentite now. And um, because what I, what I love about what uh, we managed to, uh, I think, do together is um, introduce Agnieszka to uh, the technological, but also the cultural, and maybe even the sort of political space. And um, I found it it's very, very uh, inspiring to see how uh, our invitation to Agnieszka did not result in her somehow discarding everything that she's ever done before to somehow come up with, you know, oh, what do I do with, you know, oh, I've got to do an NFT now. No, if anything, what we see uh, and a number of people that I've spoken to who know who know Agnieszka's work now for over a decade have said, no, this is the, this is the perfect kind of evolution 
of, uh, of, of Agnieszka's, um, you know, recurrent obsessions, her interests, and, uh, uh, but it's happening uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of extreme present um, uh, technological and cultural space, right? So um, I think, uh, I mean, we're very ambitious. I think part of the ambition is that we are always commissioning new projects. So we simply don't accept that somebody, you know, sends us something that they've already done and say, can you mint this? this JPEG or this MP4, simply not interested in that. Because as I said, I mean, as I alluded to at the end of my presentation, um, you know, I, I think one of the roles that uh, artists have uh, played um, in relation to the history of technology is they, uh, they have the potential, I believe, to uh, give visibility to something that I call you know, the technological unconscious, right? So, you know, if, I mean, every technology will come with a, a sort of rhetoric uh, and it will be obviously usually a positivist rhetoric uh, by its, you know, by its producer. So when we think about, uh, when we think about the rhetoric of Silicon Valley, let's not forget that Google's uh, first uh, slogan uh, mantra was don't be evil. So at the beginning, it was the Google logo and underneath it said, don't be evil, right? I mean, how, how naive that now seems, no? But at the same time, I think they, do, they did mean that, no? So um, what, I, what I, you know, if I think about Trevor Paglin, if I think about Vito Still, you know, I, the, to me, these are all artists that managed to, in a way, X-ray through the positivist rhetoric of technology and show us what is often uh, uh, there, but not visible, right? And so, you know, I, what I want to achieve in our collaboration with, with artists is for each of the artists to have a, uh, you know, a, a sort of profound encounter engagement with this form of technology that is still very nascent. And in their case, maybe something new, Right, but there's something in that encounter that will reveal latent or invisible aspects to the technology and the culture of the technology that ultimately will form foundations of historical meaning. Right. So, I mean, that's the ambition yeah, yeah. That I have. You right. So, um, but I'm I'm curious to hear from Agnieszka, You know uh, how she would answer that. And also, of course, I would love to hear Yana's uh, response as well. And her, just to mention yeah. that Yana also made an NFT for uh, K, if Yana, if you can remind me, K um, in Dusseldorf. K21. Is, K21, thank you, yeah. Uh, that is also marvelous. So yeah, let's hear the two of you. And then I'm just going to ask a question from the audience because we're running out of time. Apologies. I'm going to be very, very brief just to, uh, to uh, respond to, um, briefly to Shimon and also to, you know, I know I'm in, uh, you mentioned the, the uh, Richard Serra's uh, idea of uh, um, a verb list and drawing as a verb um, as a point of reference. And I, I think that, um, uh, you know, with sentimentite, uh, it's also a neologism, and I actually do create neologism very often in, in my work, and that's one of the reasons I think that because Sh Shumon works primarily with, with writing and curating, and that there's a lot of dialogue between us around, around that question. But, you know, for me, it was this um, idea of uh, um, sentiment of creating new matter, new kind of matter. And uh, this matter that is precisely this kind of web 2.5, uh, the something that is between digital and, and analog and physical, and, uh, and and physically, you know, both the form, the digital forms that we created, it's a, basically a system that allows for uh, um, creation of, of this uh, di digital mineral forms, uh, speculative future currencies, um, and the physical sculpture is also made of a material that uh, collects all these uh, objects that were currencies before into one aggregated uh, mixed new future currency speculation. So, um, uh, and for me, between this kind of thinking and uh, about uh, this distributed self and the bro broken self and the kind of, you know, the, this, in, 
situation in which we are dealing now, how uh, ourselves are hugely distributed across all these devices and there are, as Shimon said, bits of ourselves everywhere. You know, this idea of continuity of digital and physical matter, uh, I kind of wanted to fold this all back into, into this uh, project of sentimentite. And, uh, you know, the fact that uh, an NFT is also creating, uh, existing in a network, a network of users, net, it, it circulates almost like some kind of, you know, Michel Serre's idea of a quasi-object uh, this was also for me a perfect opportunity with this new medium to think about these aspects of uh, that other art uh, art forms do not allow for. Thank you, and and Yena, and yeah, I just I have to add that all of those notions from archiving, audience, public space, circulation, abstraction, and temporality really do. Uh, supplement a different manifestation in your digital artworks, whether if they are NFTs or another. So yeah, Yena, maybe you can respond. Yeah, in terms of actions that you mentioned, I I thought of this kind of um, like the, the sort of transformative potential of digital um, artifacts. And particularly, um, I thought of uh, the action of mu mutation. Um, in reference to a friend of mine's uh, artist Har Harman Torpel's Tar uh, work, uh, Mutant Garden Cedars, um, which is, I think, quite a good example of an NFT uh, project, sort of using the full potential of the, the technology. So there are these uh, responsive uh, blockchain native life forms that change or mutate over time. Um, and yeah, it, it it's also like a like a project that takes randomness from the blockchain, so kind of uses it it fundamentally like that. But and another thing that I thought about um, on a more sort of organizational resource level, um, I think there's a lot of potential to sort of redistribute resources and value also in the field of art. Um, uh, in like, for example, I'm thinking of some um, DAOs, um, like decentralized autonomous organizations that are based on smart contracts and and stored on the blockchain uh, that work to share revenue between artistic collaborators in a sort of more like fair and transparent way. Um, I, I'll just mention a few projects that I think of in this uh, context, like the Black Swan DAO in operating from Trust here in Berlin, or or Ruth Catlow, who Schumann mentioned uh, before at Further, Further Field in London, uh, that has also been, uh, both of these projects are kind of concerned with uh, ways to um, support kind of new or like kind of new support structures for artistic work and also um, sort of ways to enlarge artistic freedoms um, and diversity. So I think these kinds of um, speaking of the more like um, value and exchange topics are are these kind of potential developments that I see in the field. I'd like to make a quick footnote that um, uh, a number of my works, including conversions and other works are actually based on redistribution of, of capital and a, a portion of, or sometimes uh, the entirety of the proceeds are redistributed. Uh, there's not, not enough time to discuss it, but uh, it's a very important new opportunity that definitely the blockchain allows for. Well, thanks. Maybe I, if anyone wants to ask a question, uh, that would be a great moment. I will just ask uh, one last question, to kind of like to conclude from um, a very kind of like mainstream perspective that speaks about, uh, you know, um, let's say text-to-image algorithms that create artworks, et cetera, and other images. Do you feel somewhat threatened by this with the whole uh, human needs not apply or uh, or not? Like, do, do you feel that it affects your day-to-day -day in any way, the creation process or? You mean, 
what what in particular i mean then? like uh stable diffusion like chat gpt um, like dal e like uh you know like what you read on the news that people say oh uh, algorithms will replace artists not that i personally think it will ever happen but i, I just wonder how you uh come across those um sayings no i think it's um for me those um those like uh, like uh, models feel very much like a sketching tool, like a great sketching tool. <laughs> to um, uh, I don't think it it really threatens, but maybe changes the the nature of art in some way. I just kind of spontaneously thought of something that I read read on a friend's Instagram the other day this week. Um, Hannah Rose Stewart mentioned that uh or proposed that it it um might not work to to build like an art career around repeating the same theme or technique anymore <laughs> because the the intelligent machines can easily pick up styles and and make them their own uh so maybe some sort of vari variability might thrive so but no <laughs> not a threat so far <laughs> I mean, I, I tried to fold it back into my work because I, I realized that, uh, you know, now that exactly the, all these styles and it's technically with stable diffusion, it's possible to just upload um, 10 images, uh, even without men mentioning uh, who the author is, whether it's Picasso or or or, or some unknown uh, artist or, or a person and to generate something based on the style. So technically somebody else could upload images of my work or the descriptions of my work and generate something new so when I realized that I just decided to to you know anticipate it and do it myself so this pro this what like generated this project errorism um, and uh, I created first generated the, the was GPT-3 descriptions of new artworks that were created by training the the model on ever descriptions of all the artworks I made to date and then I worked with a holographic uh, company to, to create holograms of these works because basically essentially this will be possible and somebody theoretically can draw profits from something uh, and already this is happening as we see how for example Disney uh, is claiming like that people are uh, generating Disney cartoons and uh, uh, this is infringing copyright very often and of course many artists uh, that are still alive especially drawing artists graphic artists uh, so already stable the Fusion, as some of you may know, is, has created rules against uh, the use of like the uh, style of a particular artist, but immediately the users managed to circumvent it and it's, uh, it's happening again. So it will be inevitable. And um, but at the same time, I mean, as um, my friend Kate Crawford and I discussed many times, uh, th there is a potential for homogenization uh, of these styles because the uh, basically the data set on which this uh, algorithm such as stable diffusion is trained, uh, uh, a huge uh, majority of these images are corporate images, stock images, which sometimes even manifest itself when you can see the watermark in the background of the newly generated stable diffusion image. Mm, and what does it mean that if all the, if many of these images are corporate, what kind of possibilities of creative use ca can this create? Uh, we can ask ourselves how creative can we be based on just this uh, a bunch of stock um, corporate images? Yeah, there have been a few recent researchers that show the, the drop in creativity level. I'm not sure how it was examined, but yeah, it's definitely an outcome. Uh, well, thank you so much. I feel like we could go on for a few more hours. I would love to, but um, I would let you go and watch the game in 40, in almost less than 45 minutes. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and thank you again, Agnieszka, Ian, and Shumon. It's been fascinating. And I, uh, I hope to see you somewhere else soon on this planet. Thank you. No. Thank you, guys. Thank you.